It's going to be a long day. Hello everyone, how are you? My name is Shane McCarthy and welcome to the series, Now and Then. In this series, I'll be taking a look at select political satire and or comedy films from 1933 to 2020. Each individual film will be discussed in four parts. First, a description of the historical background surrounding the year which this film was released. Second, a detailing of the film's cast, crew, and premise, along with targets of political satire and or humor. Third, my own personal view of the film, along with my own personal take on its politics. And fourth, finding any connections, allegories, metaphors, or anything of the sort relating to modern day politics. I did what I could, but if there's any inaccuracies or misattributions, feel free to comment them below. And with all that being said, let's start it off with 1933's Duck Soup. Now, before I officially start this off, I would like to reveal to you all my political viewpoints and history. I am a democratic eco-socialist and currently align myself with the Green Party. Other parties I support include Brian Limited to the Socialist Party, the Peace and Freedom Party, the Communist Party, the Party for Socialism and Liberation, the American Solidarity Party, left-wing independents, progressive anti-establishment Democrats, and anti-establishment in general. I grew up in a moderate conservative family, but was always kind of the outlying liberal. I was liberal up until my declaration as a democratic eco-socialist in March of 2021. In case you ask, yes, most, but not all of it, was because of Bernie Sanders. He didn't really initiate the transition, he more so accelerated it. Since garnering the ability to think critically, I've always been distant towards the Republican Party, but I officially have the Democrats behind, or more so the corporate Dems, in 2020. And here we are today. Now onto the real content. Though I will try to be as objective as possible, my personal biases might come loose, so... Heads up. By 1933, there seemed to be a sense of hope in the U.S. as the never-ending Great Depression entered its fourth year. After years of horrifically misguided attempts to rebound the economy, Herbert Hoover's first and only term ended on a sour note, and was succeeded by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Once inaugurated, FDR immediately got to work, signing an unprecedented number of executive orders and creating the New Deal, a series of public works programs hoping to provide jobs and rebuild the economy. It was too early to tell, but it seemed that America had received a president that was more in touch with the people. Unfortunately, outside the United States came a new era of fascism. Mussolini had not only retained, but even expanded his hold on Italy after taking it over in 1921 and being declared prime ruler in 1922. Following in his steps was the official birth of the German Third Reich, led by Adolf Hitler. A man that had rejuvenated Germany, a country otherwise left to perpetual economic ruin following World War I. Hitler would establish the Nazi regime and set the stage for an ethnocentric state based around creating the Aryan master race. He was setting the stage for the Holocaust, a mass extermination of those who practiced Judaism. With those two ruling, the threat of World War II only became more real. All the while, the U.S. retained an isolationist position. Back in the U.S., one industry seemed to be rather unaffected by the Great Depression. Entertainment. Kept alive through the creation of escapist content, something people seeked more than ever. This film being one of them. <laughs> Released on November 17, 1933, Duck Soup is a farcical political comedy directed by Leo McCary from a story written by Bert Kalmar and Harry Ruby, who also wrote the music and lyrics. Additional dialogue was provided by Arthur Sheikman and Nat Perrin. Headline the film were the Marx Brothers, a comedy trope consisting of members Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo. Supporting players include Baron Limited to Margaret Dumont, Raquel Torres, Louis Calhern, Edmund Brees, Leonid Kinski, Charles Middleton, and Edgar Kennedy. So in the fictional country of Fredonia, the country is in massive debt only to be bailed out by wealthy elitist Gloria Teasdale under one condition. Second condition being that Rufus T. Firefly, an incompetent, vulgar commoner, be appointed president, to which they hesitantly agree. Meanwhile, Ambassador Trentino, leader of the fictional country of Slovenia, attempts to annex the land of Fredonia by sending in two spies to gather information on Rufus. The problem is he sent Pinky and Ciccolini, two guys that can't tell their head from their toes and constantly get into squabbles with the street vendor. And with that, hijinks ensue. The film's targets for humor are authoritarianism, more severely fascism, musicals, blind sycophancy, and the Hays Code. This is actually my introduction to the Marx Brothers on film. And what an introduction. 88 years old, and this is still one of the funniest comedies I've ever seen. Like the best films anchored by a comedy troupe or duo, it takes a concept, builds it around their established personas, and takes full advantage of it. The result here is anarchic and buried chaos, with just enough sprinkling of straight man to balance it all out. At 68 minutes, it takes full advantage of its possibilities without having to resort to padding. Though it makes great use of all the brothers' talents, the true star for me here is Groucho. This guy was an expert wordsmith. I think my favorite line is, Go find me a four-year-old child, I can't make hands and tails of this. 
Not surprising, my favorite line from Chico is, Dallas taxes. Harpo is a charmingly impulsive child in a man's body. A man of no words, yet visually and physically skilled enough to craft a character. Especially when messing with street vendors. Chico effectively blends Groucho's wordplay and Harpo's physicality, but still makes it all of his own. Zeppo is a solid straight man and second-in-command to Groucho, with moments of him devolving into far serving as effectively humorous contrast. Margaret Dumont was an excellent straight man, though I will admit her off-key singing was pretty funny. The musical numbers are wonderfully jarring with humorously sloppy choreography and behind beats and occasionally very lackluster singing. My favorite one happens completely out of nowhere during a courtroom scene, and not only is it really funny, it lasts as long as it needs to be without it overextending. The singing is arguably at its most competent, but the choreography is so sloppy and almost improv-esque. And the best scene out of all of them is the mirror scene. It's a masterwork of visual comedy that's tightly paced and highly varied. The fact that Groucho switches sides and doesn't even notice is the icing on the cake. It's no surprise to me that this scene has been homage and parodied many times. Three instances I can recall being Gilligan's Island, The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy, and My Little Pony Friendship is Magic. As for issues, there are some jarring jump cuts and scene transitions. While I can't think of any that come to mind, there are a handful of scenes that kind of end a little too fast, and there's also some cuts that are timed too early. Also, there's a little bit too much ambience, and they could have fixed that with a bit more score, sound cues, or sound effects. And while the conclusion is funny, I do think it ends a little too abruptly. The only thing that's really aged poorly is the limited role the women play in the film. Also, no racial diversity. It's not a requirement, but here it is a little bit distracting. As for its politics, it's not really commenting on anything, it's just choosing the concept of authoritarianism and using it as a basis for humor. It's not trying to be social commentary, it's just trying to have fun with the concept, and it works. And honestly, if you ever want to ask about political commentary, this famous quote from Groucho says it best. We were just four Jews trying to get a laugh. And I laughed until my sides were on fire. Though if there needs to be any greater point to this, they were elated when Benito Mussolini banned the film. There doesn't seem to be any kind of jabs towards the U.S. government, especially because it was too early to tell with FDR. The most prominent on Twitter, a handful of journalists, notably Luke Eplin of Slate and Bill Straub of the North Kentucky Tribune, compared Rufus T. Firefly to former President Donald Trump. More so his attitude and animated nature, though they did allude to his allegedly fascistic tendencies. After just now, I typed in Duck Soup Trump, and not only did I get links to the Slate and Northern Kentucky Tribune articles, I also got links to articles by Washington Post, Real Clear Politics, and New Yorker, among others. I agree with most of them, though there are a handful of them, including ones I do agree with that I do find highly exaggerated. Before we get to that, I would like to say that Trump was actually worse than Rufus in terms of attitude. Rufus was a goof, whereas Trump was an antagonistic nutcase. Here's my take. Rufus was a dumb commoner. Trump was a dumb failed businessman that was born into wealth. Rufus lost one staff member. Trump lost dozens. Rufus became infamous right after being appointed. Trump was infamous decades before being elected. Though I'll give them this, both were unpopular choices to run the office. Also, unlike Rufus, Trump actually got things done. For example, his tax cuts, primarily for the rich, and increased military spending. Also, Rufus started a war, whereas Trump didn't, though supposedly he almost did. Rufus did whatever the hell he wanted, whereas Trump had an actual platform, unpopular as it was. Rufus was private, whereas Trump attended the press conferences, berated the media, and popularized the term fake news. Whereas Rufus was selected, Trump was democratically elected in and out. Not to mention when members of his campaign team or cabinet did something wrong, they got convicted. Some got pardoned by him, yes, but at least there was some level of accountability. While he has sizable following both in and outside of Congress, the same also applies to the opposition, and they protested him until the very end. Honestly, I would say every administration on display embodied some aspect of Rufus T. Firefly or aspects of the subjects that were satirized in Duck Soup. One example, our founding fathers owned slaves. Second example, the entirety of Andrew Jackson's presidency. John Adams' administration gave us the Alien Act, and Woodrow Wilson's gave us the Sedition Act, which is still in effect today. Not to mention, after we entered World War II, FDR set up Japanese internment camps, arguably the most disgusting moment of his presidency. Thankfully, it was put to an end and we paid reparations. Also, before Donald Trump, we had George W. Bush, whose administration declared war in Iraq, passed No Child Left Behind Act, and the Patriot Act. Also tax cuts, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The passage of the Patriot Act and the establishment of the NSA would render the concept of privacy non-existent, and that would be confirmed to us in 2013 after former employee Edward Snowden leads their data. Honestly, if you wanted me to be more specific with categorization, I would say Trump represents the more animated side of Rufus, and Andrew Jackson represented the more dangerous side of Rufus. 
Don't get me wrong, Chuck was definitely dangerous, but he was just too ridiculous for me to really consider him a true threat. Also, Hoover's decision making was more based on gross miscalculation than anything related to authoritarianism. A lot of these comparisons seem to stem from the fear of what Trump could have been or what he could have done, but I don't think we entirely reached that point. It got close at points, but I think it was overall thwarted. Hopefully there's nowhere to go but up from here. Oy. And if Trump is elected in 2024, hopefully my claim still rings true. And we've reached the end. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the first episode. I hope you enjoyed what I had to offer today. Like, comment, share, subscribe, I suit you best. Thank you guys for watching. Until the next video, see ya.